Hey, welcome to the Kingdoms Podcast. My name is Luke and I host this with my buddy, Matt Ma. And our goal is to empower you to discover how your faith impacts culture for God's kingdom. To do that, we're sitting down with different men and women from all kinds of disciplines to uncover how they, through their ambitions and vocational skill set, make a difference in the lives of those around them. And so if this is helpful to you, we'd love it if you could like it, share it, and subscribe. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. for joining us for this conversation on the Kingdoms Podcast. I'm, I'm super thankful uh, to be here with someone many of you have heard of as a writer, as a speaker, as a spiritual leader, a justice advocate, and, and so much more, Danielle Strickland. Danielle, thank you for making time today. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, we're, we're really looking forward to, to learning from you and, and yeah, just diving into some meaningful conversation together. Uh, real quick, though, to start, Danielle, I know you've described yourself uh, as a prodigal kid, kind of as a teenager, as, as an adolescent. And to give people maybe a snapshot of your story, why, why prodigal? And, and what were the circumstances that led you uh, to encountering Jesus? Yeah, so I grew up uh, in the church. My parents were pastors uh, with the Salvation Army. And uh, for some reason I had, well, there's probably a whole bunch of factors. Uh, One was some sexual abuse in my background, but also uh, just some misunderstandings about God. I really believed that God was angry or perpetually disappointed that I couldn't measure up, uh, that he wasn't happy with me. And uh, and that manifested itself in rebellion, right? Like I didn't wanna be part of that uh, anymore. And, um, and so I believed what I say is a lie and mm-hmm. that's that rebellion leads to freedom. And, uh, and of course I discovered really quickly that rebellion leads the opposite direction. It leads to smaller and smaller and smaller life. And until the smallest place I ever got to was inside a jail cell in downtown Toronto. And I was visited there by a friend of my parents who were part of the Salvation Army, uh, who came over on her lunch break. Uh, she was like in charge of like all of the programs in the Salvation Army in Canada, but she made her way on her lunch break to come see me. And I remember, uh, you know, just kind of watching her come going, oh, brother, you know, the last <laughs> thing I want to see is the Salvation Army. You know, I was trying to get, get, get away from those guys. And, uh, and she just came in. She didn't say anything. She just wrapped her arms around me. She passed me a lawyer's card. She wrapped her arms around me and she just whispered in my ear, I love you. And I was like, I was still high. I was not interested. I was not open. So literally like I didn't have her back. I just stood there uh, and said like, you didn't even bring me a smoke. You know, I wasn't grateful. I wasn't humble, like none of the things. And then uh, when she left, I remember hearing the door, you know, the the cement, you know, the metal door clang shut. And I was Mm -hmm. alone in this holding cell, downtown city hall, Toronto. And I I had a vision uh, of Jesus. I don't know if it was a vision or if it was a visitation. I can't really tell you, I just, Jesus came in and he did the exact same thing that she had just done. He wrapped his arms around me and he whispered in my ear, I love you. And I describe it like, you know, it was like someone turned a light on Mm. and I came to myself. Like I literally was like, I'm in jail. Like, you know, all of a sudden it dawned on me what Mm. my life was becoming. And I still didn't, I still don't think I quite realized that uh, Jesus is all love. Like, I think I still kind of went into that default mode of like, I better clean up my life to get good enough, mm-hmm. you know, and sort of perpetuated this idea of I've got to do something here. Even though constantly Jesus keeps telling me, this is really left out even more about me. So the prodigal is the story Jesus tells of a father who has a son similar to that, just the heads off rebellion, does his own thing, wastes all the money, all the resources, and then comes back. Uh, sort of rehearsing this, uh, the statement, but recently on a podcast with a theologian friend, we discovered that even that statement that he tells his dad, uh, it, in, in the way Jesus tells it, it suggests that it's not even that sincere. Mm. Um, like he's not really like, sorry, he's just stuck and he has nowhere else to go. And then even while he's saying it, so before he even gets it out, uh, the father comes and wraps his arms around the son. Yeah. And so it's this, again, this is not about how sorry the son is. It's not a conversation in tough love. You know, there's none of those things going on. It is all about the father who yeah. is running after uh, his children to tell them that they're welcome and that they're loved no matter what. Yeah. And that is such a radical message. I mean, even still, I find it hard to believe. Wow. 
And I imagine that that like self-giving God is something that like motivates you today, but maybe you could speak more to that. Um, actually, probably the first time I, I, I had ever uh, seen you speak was at uh, Exponential a couple of years ago. And you were talking about uh, church planting and uh, justice initiatives, anti-human trafficking. Uh, you were talking about all of these different things that you were involved in. And uh, clearly you're a very ambitious person for the sake of the kingdom of God. And uh, maybe you could speak to how you really like discern what God wants you to do with your life. You know, if God has done this thing for you, um, how do you discern what you ought to then do? And um, maybe you can even talk about how you kind of like see those ambitions becoming realities. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Thanks. I think that for me, you know, rule of thumb is usually like, I, I, I try to tell people to do what's in front of them. Uh, so I, I do think that sometimes we have these ideas that, you know, like people will say like, how did you become a speaker? And I'll be like, I don't really know. Um, I like, I didn't try, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I didn't like path, like chart a path. So the way that I see uh, the kingdom of God unfolding in my life is much more like a connect the dot puzzle mm. than an actual, you know, program proposal. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's a bunch of reasons for that. I think that, um, I don't think God's impressed with success. I, I, I don't think that's his plan is to kind of like, you know, um, elevate people. I think his plan is obedience and relationship. It's just, yeah. it's love, it's relationship, it's connection. So like how, however, and that this is the idea of connect the dot, like what is God telling you to do in front of you? Like today, what is the thing that you can do that is just responding to God's invitation? And then you'll discover as you do that every day, every day, every day, that it'll lead somewhere. But like, when you look back on it, you'll go, oh, I see he was, you know, so even the justice advocacy piece in me, I didn't pursue justice. Uh, what happened was I, I started to love people who were broken and vulnerable and poor because I felt like God told me to do it. And so as I did that, I started to hear their stories, empathize. I started to connect the dots that this wasn't just one person's experience. This was a whole bunch of people's experience. And then it kind of led me to sort of the system systemic nature of injustice. So I think it's same with church planting. I, I, I didn't really set out to be a church planter, but I did want to reach people who didn't know Jesus or didn't have, you know, the experience of a church in their neighborhood. And, and that's kind of where that led. So I, I think ultimately, if you, if you want to just keep relationship with Jesus at the heart of what it is that you do, who knows where you'll go? I mean, this is, that's yeah. up to God, right? To decide. So rather than aiming, and this is the opposite of all the business advice you'll ever hear, right? So this is one of the problems is sometimes we take a business model and we apply it to the kingdom mm -hmm. and you're kind of like, Mah, I'm not sure Jesus had one of those models, you know, because instead of ascending, Jesus yeah. kept descending. So that's weird. Uh, but whatever he ended up doing ended up changing the world for everybody, for you and me. And so it worked, but just not in the way that we thought it would work. So it's about surrendering some of those ideas of ascension mm. and actually just doing what it is that God tells you to do for today. And, um, and I think those moments, a lot of those things come out of where we've been before. So, you know, so one of the first things I did when I got saved was I volunteered on a street outreach for street kids downtown Toronto mm. because I knew what it felt like to be lost and broken and a write-off, you know, and excluded. And I wanted to share that, that that's not how I see anybody. I wanted to kind of contribute right away into that space. And then that of course led to a whole lifetime of, you know, soup kitchens and homeless shelters and, you know, like a whole, but I didn't mm -hmm. know that then I just was doing what it was that I needed to do in response to what God had done for me. So so I would say pursue less of the business plan agenda to get to like some sort of height hmm. and a little bit more of like a daily practice of relationship and connection and obedience with what it is that God's calling you to do. Yeah. And uh, you'll discover this connect the dot cool thing that he's making with your life. Yeah. That's I so helpful because so. I think sometimes we get so overwhelmed by how big the issues that our world faces today. Yes. And I think for a lot of young people to think like, how do, how do I tackle that massive systemic issue? Um, but the way that you've put it, I think is so helpful that, you know, do the thing in front of you, um, meet the need that you can. And, and like you say, connect the dots. That's so mm -hmm. helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe this is a page out of, this is, this is a page out of Jesus, by the way. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite stories is the Mount of Transfiguration. 
Mm. And it's this big reveal, right? Like this is like, this is the cosmic Christ. This is the Messiah. Like this is the one shining with the glory. This is the Daniel vision. I mean, this is all the things. And then the disciples are like, whoa, like we're entering some big space. And then Jesus says, okay, now follow me. And he leads them down, 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 down. The scripture says off the mountain into a valley. So like, this is down, 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 down. And the first thing he does is he leads them to a father and a son. Mm. You remember? And the son is uh, demonically possessed or, you know, struggling and no one can help him. And Jesus gives himself to that one son and father. And that's the way of the kingdom. And over and over and over again, we tell ourselves that can't be it. (laughs) <laughs> that can't be it and it's always it that's always it yeah hey great yeah great scriptural illustration there and, and maybe even just to to piggyback with what you were saying a minute ago um, especially with regards to to justice and how we advocate for justice and be those people who are willing to descend down step into the gray spaces the, the messy areas um, I wonder what would be your thoughts on on how we can not just be aware of the need for justice but but choose to see that need for justice in our in our world around us and and also what would your challenge be to people who might be like wow like yeah i've heard of needs for justice i realize there might be ways in my community i'm not sure exactly what to do um what's the cost of refusing to take seriously seeing justice like what's what's the cost of, of refusing uh to be an advocate for justice of having apathy towards injustice uh, around you yeah i mean the cost is a terrible reflection of god hmm. Uh, that's the cost. And it's a, it's a big cost uh, that no, we don't, we don't just pay that cost. The whole world pays that cost. Yeah. So uh, justice is not a separate, you know, we're not talking about the gospel and then we add justice onto it. Mm. The good news at the core of the gospel is this right relationship is God making all things right. The renewal yeah. of all things, including our lives and mm-hmm. hearts through Jesus, mm-hmm. but also the renewal of the way he designed everything to work. Yeah. So of course, injustice is a direct, you know, opposite of his plan and his will. Yeah. And, um, and so Jesus's presence and his desire, you know, this is, this is what he, you know, Luke one, you know, the way that he presented his ministry is like the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, right. Yeah. To bind up the brokenhearted, to release the captive. Like yeah. this is the central message of Jesus. And I think one of the great problems we have is that we, we kind of make it this like side hustle mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, only woke or liberal people have. I mean, it's, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. Um, it, it is a core message of the gospel. And I say this, you know, I think a whole generation is so tired of a proclamation of the gospel without a demonstration of its power. Yeah. Mm. And when justice comes, when right relationships are made, when reconciliation comes between nations, you know, when racism is confronted and overthrown in the way that we live, that's the demonstration of the power of the gospel. Like Amen that's when that. we say, this is what God can do. Yeah. And so, and we see this in the early church in the letters that Paul writes, you know, like this is why in Christ, there is no longer divisions. This is why in second Corinthians, Paul says, I can no longer see anyone through a worldly point of view. There is no us and them anymore. This gospel has brought us all into this flourishing of the world. So I would say the best way to pursue this, by the way, is always to get out of issues and into people. Mm -hmm. Get out of issues and into people. And I would say that proximity is power. Mm -hmm. So all justice, if it's issue-based, will always go somewhere sideways. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Justice is never issue-based for God. Justice is always about people. It's okay. always about relationship. It's always yeah. about right relationships between people. So if racism is like on your mind, which it should be, we're in a season right now in the world where God's exposing racism and wanting to do something about it, the best way that you can pursue, you know, sort of the gospel in anti-racism behavior is to go find some people who are different than you mm-hmm. and learn and listen and be in relationship yeah. with a diverse company. And I mean, I know I say this all the time and people are always like, no, no, I'll sign the petition. You know, it's like, no, we don't need your name on a petition. We need you to create right relationships in your own community. Yeah. So where are the haves? Where are the have nots? Where are the people, you know, who are experiencing racism and why aren't you friends with them? Yeah. Because this is what Jesus does, right? Jesus is constantly going out of his way to get in the way of injustice. And he does this through connection and proximity. So everyone else, religious impulses are like, oh no, all those people stay over there right? Mm -hmm. So we have segregated our neighborhoods. We've separated people who have from have nots and all this kind of stuff. And the gospel impulse, the Jesus impulse is to always go out of our way to get in the way. 
yeah. to ask the questions to create relationships. That's the move of justice is right relationships so that we can demonstrate what the power of Jesus can do. Wow, well, amen to that. Maybe you can keep on talking about that. Like you had mentioned that when Jesus came and, and preached the gospel, that it wasn't a gospel that just saved us from like impending judgment or something. In, in your book, uh, The Ultimate Exodus, you say that salvation doesn't just get you out of something, but it gets you into something. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can speak to how the gospel empowers us, uh, not just to become free from impending judgment, uh, but to live free, to kind of like live, as, as you mentioned, like in that peace-filled life today. Yeah, I think it's this danger that the church has always had, even from the very beginning, uh, you know, where Paul, you know, just sort of really talks about the danger of Gnosticism or this idea that you can separate the spiritual reality of what's happened to you from the physical and incarnated the way that you live in the world. Yeah. And this separation, you know, and this has happened for generations, but this, this idea that we've separated our spiritual, and we see the toxic reality of this when we, you know, we're listening even this week to leaders who we thought were something that they're not, right? Mm -hmm. So we've separated this idea of our spiritual life and we've contained it as the spiritual thing. And then everything else that we do is just other things. Mm -hmm. And that the spiritual belief or faith or system doesn't impact the way that we live. This is uh, dangerous in our own lives because what it does is it limits, it restricts the gospel, the good news, this right relationship, this freedom that God has to, to free us from what oppresses us, yeah. not just spiritually, but really, like literally, like God doesn't want to just save me spiritually from my addiction. He wants me to be free from my addiction in the here and the now, you right. know, and this is free of, this is true of every issue, whatever the issue is. So I would say that that, that danger of, you know, and this is where Jesus is constantly like asking people to embody. Now, it, this is interesting because in, in the Hebrew culture, there really isn't this, I think, therefore I am builders, yeah. tradesmen, you know, people who had skill to do things. So wisdom in a Hebrew culture really meant action. It meant trade. It meant like embody. So for Hebrews, they don't like that culture didn't understand the separation. That's really a Greek thing that came in later, that there was this way of believing that wasn't connected to our behaviors. That's just, a, that's a new phenomenon, but we've all been raised in that idea that our beliefs are different from our behaviors, mm. whether we, and this is true, whether we know someone who's a nurse who smokes, you know, or a doctor who like has these horrible you know, addictions and, and they know, I mean, it's, it's not a belief problem. It's not like they're yeah. like, oh no, I don't believe that. They believe that. They just have separated what it is they believe from their behavior. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the great, great things we can do is to, is to, is to bring those things together, is to embody yeah. the message of the gospel in the way we live. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, this uh, perpetuated in, in the Exodus, I talk a little bit about the perpetuation of slavery mm -hmm. Uh, using the Bible, using spirituality, using mm -hmm. even a belief yeah. as like a club, as a theological way of perpetuating injustice. Mm -hmm. That's a disembodied spirituality. That's where it leads mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because they didn't connect their belief in God to this, you know, right relationship with their brothers and sisters who are different uh, color than them. So yeah. this is very dangerous um, theology. And I think very dangerous practice. One of my favorite verses is in, in Thessalonians, where it says that God wants your whole spirit, soul, and body yeah. to be made whole. And we translated that to be blameless, but it actually is much more in keeping with to be made whole, to be brought. And again, back to this right relationships, God, the gospel wants to make you in right relationship with yourself, Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can stop living this compartmentalized life, but you can yeah. come into wholeness. And then that wholeness, which is really the word for that is shalom that that just keeps growing. Mm. So you're made in right relationship with God. You're made in right relationship with yourself. Then you're made mm. in right relationship with your neighbor. The neighbors are made in right relationship with their communities and communities are in right relationship with their, and on and on this goes. I mean, that's the nature of the gospel. I love that so much because it, it really like lifts our, our expectation of what God can do like in the here and now, right? It's yeah. not something for tomorrow. It's something that we can like fully embody today in yeah. such a beautiful way. Absolutely. I, and I wonder, Danielle, could you, like, given your own story, given given what you just said, you know, I anticipate there's there's listeners who are saying, but I, I I'm not living that right now. I, I feel stuck. I feel trapped. I know in my head, but 
in my heart, I, I feel like there's yet to be this place of knowing the freedom that the gospel brings. And so for people who maybe are feeling trapped, whether that's addiction or shame or despair or something else, uh, who really are doubting that, that freedom and healing are possible, uh, what would you say to, to encourage them to, to speak life into their circumstances? Yeah, I mean, I would say that one, like, there's a lot of hope that God has a design for you. And this is not about the design that God has for you, the love that God has for you, the worth that God has for you, the value that God has for you. You already have hmm. all that's all of that's already there. And that your addiction or the things that you're struggling with, or even your sin are these terrible disguises. They're these, um, they're these wrappings, they're these burden, they're these weights. There's this, you know, uh, perpetual idea of slavery. That's all on top of you. And this is the good news of the gospel that Jesus wants to unravel that away yeah. Yeah. and that you don't have to do that by yourself. You can do that with him. This is what he's come to do. This is what makes it good news. Yeah. The good news isn't that you're terrible and horrible and God loves you anyway. The good news is that you're actually made in his image, that he loves you and he longs for you. And he made a way for you to be free with him. So I would say that that relationship, even though you feel unworthy and you're maybe you, in the back of your mind, you keep believing that God's probably disappointed and angry with you, that the opposite is true, mm -hmm. that God loves you. I mean, one of Jesus's favorite titles was friend of sinners, yeah. right? He let, there's nothing that you need to change before you invite Jesus into your experience. Yeah. But when you invite Jesus into your experience, that relationship, that light, that love will begin, you know, will begin to actually undo the oppressive, mm. even in your mind, the darkened understanding, uh, and will begin to undo what it is that oppression's done in your life. And that the, the only way really to do that is to get with some people. Yeah. Uh, there's some ways, you know, like I created this thing called infinitum, which is a, a posture prayer. And, you know, if you're uh, stuck in addiction, a 12 step program, uh, which is really just describing Jesus, by the way, a higher power that is loving and good and true. This is Jesus. So mm. don't be afraid. Even 12 step programs are great to give you a way to yeah. begin to process your way out of addiction. But I would say a church community, uh, I'm in the middle of the creative way down course, which is a course I created for people to, to help them descend through the beatitudes, mm. uh, into more and more a deeper relationship with Christ that has been Ooh, that's mind-blowingly good. I'm yeah. loving it. I'm loving it, uh, doing it with a group. So I would say get connected, uh, get connected with other people and get honest, invite Jesus in, in the midst. Don't wait till you're ready and clean and sorted. Mm. Uh, you need him now. And he loves you now. And this yeah. is that prodigal son. There's a full circle, this podcast. <laughs> he comes running towards you, even if you're just sick and tired of the consequences of your, of your sin and not even, you know, like, don't worry. He's got you. He loves you. He comes yeah. after you and yeah. uh, wants to be with you. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Amen to that. Well, Oh, Danielle, so many good things. Hey, we want we want to honor our time together with you, and and you just just touched on a couple of the initiatives you're a part of. But uh, what Matt and I would would love to know, and what we'd love for our listeners to know, is um, where can they learn more about you, about some of these initiatives that you're a part of, the ways in which you're promoting spiritual formation, whether that's the Infinitum Prayer um, uh, or other things like that. We'd love to hear about what you're a part of, so that people who are listening can get engaged themselves. Yeah, great. Thanks for asking. Um, so daniellestrickland.com is probably the best place to go. It'll kind of take you to all the other places. Um, the spiritual uh, thing I was talking about, infinitum, is infinitumlife.com. Uh, that's hard to spell. So sometimes it's easier to go to daniellestrickland.com and then press on the link to go to infinitum. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's designed, uh, most of those resources are completely free. So yeah. it's, it, it would be good for you to get, get started. Um, and then on all the social media handles on Instagram, I think yeah. I'm just Danielle Strickland. I, you can just, you'll find me on all the handles, on all the things. All the things. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And well, as someone who's been a part of the Infinitum uh, monthly day of prayer uh, mm -hmm. starting this year, I know I've really benefited from that and would encourage listeners to check that out. But Danielle, this has been awesome. Like so many amen moments. I can't speak for Matt, but I just want, if we could interrupt on interviews, be like, amen, amen to that. Like <laughs> preach it, say it again. Boom. I'm excited so, to listen to this again. Already, yeah. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for the difference you're making in the world for the kingdom of God. We're super grateful to be able to have had this interview with you. That's Thanks so much, guys. And I was even thinking, you know, your church is Emmanuel. And uh, what a beautiful name. 
Mm. right? God with us. And if I I just, as one last encouragement to you guys, but also to all of us who are struggling right now through a pandemic and who have never really been more despairing in our culture, Mm. uh, God's with us, huh? Where he he will not leave us and he will not leave you. So know that God is with you and that that actually, that pursuit, that God with you and you with God, that's, that's the aim of all of our lives. So be blessed. Thanks for having me guys. I really appreciate all that you're doing. Oh goodness. Thank you, Danielle. Bless you.